Muy buenas noches. Sean ustedes bienvenidos a la sesión 279 de la Academia Nacional de Arquitectura, capítulo Monterrey. Agradecemos a todos los que hacen posible que el capítulo siga trabajando para alcanzar el objetivo de conocer, reconocer y dar a conocer la arquitectura contemporánea. Okay. Muy especialmente a los amigos de la Academia por su constante apoyo. Agradecemos a nuestros amigos VIP Armstrong, Cemex, Crest, Gilsa, Interceramic y Versitalia, así como a Cubrelam, Natusi, Para el Rey y Vidrios el Castillo. Hoy queremos dar la bienvenida a un nuevo amigo de la academia, Natusi, fabricante de muebles de diseño italiano que busca lograr una combinación armoniosa de tradición y modernidad. Mezcla de artesanía e innovación. Y que a partir de esta noche nos acompaña como amigo del capítulo Monterrey de la Academia. Especialmente gracias a Margarita Treviño, directora de marca, que hoy nos acompaña. Gracias amigos de Natusi, bienvenidos. Los invito a que sigan en nuestras redes sociales y a que se suscriban a nuestra página de web www.anamti.org. Y, a también, y también, perdón, a nuestro canal de YouTube, donde pueden consultar todas nuestras sesiones. Doy la bienvenida a las personas que nos acompañan esta tarde. El arquitecto Jaime Juárez, presidente del capítulo Sinaloa de la Academia Nacional de Arquitectura. La arquitecta Lilian Ponce, vicepresidenta de la Academia Nacional de Arquitectura. Y también al arquitecto Valentín Martínez, presidente de la SURMA. Buenas noches, gracias por estar con nosotros. Siendo las 19 horas del día 7 de febrero del año 2022, tengo el gusto de abrir esta sesión ordinaria número 279 de la Academia Nacional de Arquitectura Capítulo Monterrey, bienio 2021-2023. <coughs> Saludo y doy la bienvenida esta noche a académicos, arquitectos, profesores y estudiantes, amigos de la academia y miembros de nuestra comunidad que esta noche nos acompañan por las plataformas Zoom y YouTube. Y agradezco muy especialmente al arquitecto paisajista Raymond Jungles que haya aceptado nuestra invitación a participar con nosotros vía Zoom desde la ciudad de Miami, Florida, en Estados Unidos. Thank you, Raymond. Cedo ahora la palabra a la arquitecta Rena Orsen Obergard, secretaria de este capítulo. Eh, hola, buenas noches, tengan todos ustedes. Damos la bienvenida a quienes esta tarde nos acompañan por las plataformas de YouTube y de Zoom. Queremos hacer una solicitud muy puntual. Por respeto a los ponientes y a la audiencia que nos acompaña, agradecemos que nuestros invitados de la plataforma Zoom mantengan su micrófono apagado durante toda la, todo el transcurso de la sesión. Podrán encenderle una vez eh, que se les conceda la palabra durante la sesión de preguntas y respuestas. Ahora cedo la palabra a la arquitecta Penélope Montes González, cronista de la Academia, quien nos presentará un resumen de la relatoría de, la relatoría de la sesión anterior. Adelante, Penelo, pues. Gracias, Lena. Gracias, Lena. Eh, buenas noches. En la sesión eh, pasada estuvo con nosotros de invitado el arquitecto Rafael Pardo. Eh, hizo su primera intervención en la ponencia, hablando acerca del contexto en el que se encuentra su obra, que es la ciudad de Jalapa, en Veracruz. Mencionó pues, las características naturales de, del, del contexto, un bosque, sin embargo, también eh, una ciudad histórica con un patrimonio eh, conviviendo con autoconstrucción en el centro. Eh, mencionaba ahí en, en, su, en su exposición que Jalapa eh, presenta una dispersidad 
dentro de su densidad y bueno, en medio de una topografía accidentada, como en este corte que están viendo de Alexander Humboldt, de el, el territorio entre el puerto de Veracruz y Jalapa, ¿no? Y bueno, mencionó también cómo el corte es uno de los dibujos que mejor comunica el, el proyecto. Eh, mencionó que también que pues cada localidad tiene componentes sonoros, que parte de estos, estos comentarios los hacía el mismo Humboldt cuando enviaba como sus crónicas hacia Europa. Y bueno, ahí mencionó este concepto de reservas sonoras de cada uno de los lugares de, de Jalapa y la necesidad de convertir al oído en un ojo. Eh, también presentó un grabado del pico de Orizaba, donde esta topografía, bueno, impresionaba al, a los, sus visitantes, ¿no? Y bueno, hay, hay grabados eh, que circulaban en Europa desde el siglo XVIII. Después de esta como breve introducción, y presentó tres proyectos. El primero fue Flavia, que es la fotografía que están observando. Es una galería de arte con cuatro departamentos en, en vertical, donde uno de los elementos representativos de la arquitectura de Jalapa, que es el alero, se, se retoma en la fachada y, bueno, se hace una sintonía con las edificaciones vecinas a partir de alturas y remetimientos. El terreno presenta una forma irregular, tiene dos accesos, se manejan elementos como la celosía, la escalera, y bueno, mencionó el arquitecto que la calidad del espacio no lo daba el metraje, sino la iluminación, la ventilación cruzada, las vistas hacia el pico de Orizaba, eh, sobre todo en esta visión de un volcán con nieve, y el departamento superior, o en la, en la altura más eh, elevada, era el que tenía pues, el, el privilegio de estas vistas hacia, hacia, el, hacia el volcán. Eh, mencionaba también ahí, por ejemplo, los, los accesos con piedra, en, en sus acabados de pisos, de, de muros, y bueno, esta convivencia que se empezaba a dar también con los vecinos, a partir de ser pues, este, esta, este doble uso ¿no? de galería y departamentos. El otro proyecto que nos presentó tenía una escala distinta, fue una casa habitación ubicada en las afueras de la ciudad, alrededor de unos 10 o 15 minutos del centro, donde aquí las vistas también se gozaban desde las fachada, la fachada posterior del edificio. Eh, resaltó la carga formal del, del volumen, o de la volumetría del objeto, y bueno, mencionó también algo de, de, de la maqueta como una herramienta para estudiar o explorar en, esta, en este sentido el, el proyecto, y bueno, también que para él la arquitectura tiene que conmover, que solamente, no es solamente un juego volumétrico, sino tiene una intencionalidad. Eh, des, eh, destacó las sombras proyectadas, sobre el concreto y los lugares exteriores del edificio como sitios para contemplar y escuchar. Eh, el siguiente proyecto que presentó fueron unos departamentos en un terreno con una topografía de alrededor del 45% dependiente y bueno, aquí destacó el, la escasa huella del, del, del edificio, 470 metros de construcción, con un frente eh, total de 35 metros, pero un, un, un uso muy limitado de 4 metros en, en el, el edificio principal o en la huella principal, y un remetimiento de 9 metros a partir de la calle. Aquí los materiales también fueron similares a los proyectos anteriores, el concreto eh, vaciado con una duela que le da una textura y, y, y un color eh, terracota. La fachada posterior del edificio fue una, es, está abierta, el, la terraza es, está jardinada, un jardín el, en la parte inferior del, del terreno, creado a partir de movimientos de, de, de tierra, formando un talud que daba una cierta privacidad al usuario del, del volumen inferior. Y bueno, luego se hicieron una, una sesión de preguntas y respuestas donde intervino los eh, eh, 
usuarios de YouTube le preguntaron acerca de la publicación y, y la etiqueta que se le dio a su arquitectura de nuevo brutalismo. Y bueno, el arquitecto comentó que más que interesarle esa etiqueta, estaba eh, más ocupado en el hacer que en el saber. Y que, bueno, conocía algunas de las menciones que hacen de su obra, pero que no tenía, no le molestaban, más bien tenía una, este, una intención más de, de, de hacer con su, con su trabajo también. Le preguntaron sobre el manejo de la luz en sus proyectos y, bueno, nos comentaba que esto era parte de una madurez y una conciencia arquitectónica que tenía en los últimos años para el manejo de la luz, el paisaje, la vegetación, el jardín y, bueno, que también se auxiliaba de especialistas en esta labor de exploración. De parte de los académicos hubo cuatro intervenciones del arquitecto Fernando López, el arquitecto Bernardo Hinojosa, el arquitecto Andola Toscano y el arquitecto Jacinto Álvarez. El arquitecto Fernando López eh, resaltó este enlace que tiene la arquitectura con el lugar y la escala en, de cada uno de los proyectos que, que era muy interesante a pesar de ser diferente, de diferente escala y la composición clara de sus proyectos. También, bueno, el arquitecto comentó cómo un edificio como Flavia tenía una intención más allá de lo arquitectónico, como un detonador de cultura. Y el, el arquitecto Bernardo Hinojosa lo cuestionó acerca de la integración de su obra con la imagen de la ciudad de Jalapa. Y el arquitecto comentó que él se dedicaba a hacer arquitectura contemporánea del siglo XXI. Y que, bueno, que aunque estaba consciente que sus edificios pudieran estar en otro sitio, eh, quería, bueno, responder también a sus propios intereses como diseñador. Y, por último, la arquitecta Nora habló de, de esta arquitectura respetuosa que presentaba y eh, le preguntó acerca de, de esta conciencia de tener menores huellas dentro de los terrenos. Y el arquitecto mencionaba que pues, era más bien su propia convicción o no un reglamento que tenía que aplicar al proyecto, eh, que la calidad en el diseño o la calidad espacial no necesitaba eh, de metros cuadrados, más bien que eh, podías hacer menos cantidad de construcción, tener menores costos y un mejor resultado. Y bueno, finalmente el, eh, hizo un comentario el arquitecto Jacinto Álvarez, ya fuera de, de línea, y pues yo, a mí me gustaría nada más resaltar como esta eh, capacidad de la, de la arquitectura de estar en, conviviendo con patrimonio um, en una ciudad contemporánea y cómo bueno, es necesario eh, considerar que hay un, hay un cambio, un movimiento en cada momento en el paisaje y que bueno, los arquitectos debemos de intentar sintonizar este, esta ciudad del pasado con el futuro. Gracias. También hay que resaltar que el texto íntegro de la relatoría de la sesión 278 se puede encontrar en la página web de la Academia www.anamci.org. Y a continuación voy a proceder eh, a, a hacer una breve semblanza eh, de nuestro eh, invitado. Uh, following Raymond Jungles, I will read a small introduction to you before you start your, your uh, lecture. Uh, Raymond Jungles es el director fundador de Raymond Jungles Incorporated, una firma de arquitecta, arquitectura paisajista cal, calaro, eh, con sede en Miami. Graduado con honores en pa arquitectura paisajista de la Universidad de Florida. Jungles es miembro de la the American Society of Landscape Architects y más allá de su práctica, Jungles es reconocido como una autoridad eh, en el trabajo del legendario paisajista brasileño Roberto Burla Max. Y como mencionó, una exposición de, en vivo del trabajo de Burla Max en el Jardín Botánico en Nueva York en, dos, en el 2019. Además, ha dictado numerosas conferencias sobre el cuerpo de trabajo de su firma en, eh, en la Universidad de Cornell, la Escuela de Graduados de Diseño de, de Harvard, eh, el Jardín Botánico de Nueva York 
eh, el Museo de Arte Moderno y la conferencia ASLA sobre arquitectura del paisaje. Eh, el, eh, el despacho es fundado en 1985 por Raymond Jungles eh, y las prioridades de diseño de la firma son generadas por la escala y la funcionalidad de un espacio. Los elementos del paisaje simple, limpio y bien detallado son las bases por excelencia de un jardín. Los volúmenes de plantación varían y los colores y texturas audaces se utilizan con intención. La firma se guía por los, principales eh, por los principios personales y de diseño de Raymond, que son integrada, integrada, integridad, eh, relevancia y honor a la naturaleza. Eh, sus diseños eh, informados eh, en, pisan suavemente la tierra, eh, propor proporcionan un hábitat e eh, incorporan elementos de sorpresa. Entre las obras destacadas de la firma se encuentran los eh, principales paisajes que rodean complejos residenciales de lujo, así como eh, los jardines privados desde las montañas de México hasta los cráteres volcánicos de Panamá, eh, frentes de playa en el Caribe, eh, los, ca los caos, caos de, de Florida y ciudades densamente pobladas como eh, Nueva York y Miami. Uh, welcome, Raymond. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much for having me. And I'm sorry I'll be speaking in English. I understood most of what you said, but I'm not that good yet. <laughs> I need to do more work in Mexico, obviously. So um, my daughter helped put this together for me. Uh, the first project is we call Ventana a la Montaña because I'll show you a little bit why later. This project we did with Gustavo Medellín and uh, Patricia Duran, who has been involved in every project that I do in her company, Atrio. This is a site plan that we did. It's up in the mountains right next to Chapinque. Working with Gustavo and the, and the clients, we designed the movement through the site and all of the hardscape uh, and the landscape, working with local uh, landscape contractors and designers to help augment the planting knowledge that I have. I've really enjoyed um, learning about the plants from Monterrey. I love the fact that you have so many encinos and so many beautiful trees and that, that uh, there's so many uh, opportunities in topography. We love topography. We don't have a lot of topography in Florida. One of the first, uh, one of the first uh, influences in my life or actually the first influence when it comes to design was Luis Barragan who often said that water is the heart and the soul of a garden. So you can see these are some of our, uh, some of our site plans that show now the planting. We get pretty specific with the trees. Our client actually owned a nursery that his father had grown all these trees that we used on the project. So it was very special for the clients to have the trees that their father had grown from very small trees to the trees that ended up gracing this project. We use mostly all local materials, local stones. And, um, and I learned a lot by my friends who would show me other projects that were done there. One of the ways that I work is to uh, sketch over photographs to sort of convey my ideas of tree placement. Um, in this case, This project had um, a steep grade down to the house that was built like a bridge. And I was trying to make the garden seem like it was built on grade. You can see some of the, uh, some of the, the, the retention that I was re, re uh, We also then uh, lay things out on the job site. Can see some of the stonework's already been done on the left. 
And then, uh, so we have these before and after pictures to show what we started with, what we ended up with. So there's safety as you go down the hill to the residents. And you, feel, you don't feel like you're in a precarious position. You feel safe. And then looking back up towards MA, uh, what was there before, it was all structure, everything man-made. And we always try to blur the boundaries between the man-made and the natural. That's what landscape architects do. They meld the living environment with the built environment. One of the reasons I love working in Mexico is the powerful architecture that I see down there. It reminds me a lot of the beautiful architecture I saw in the many years that I went down to Brazil and, and traveled around with Burley Marx as basically as part of his entourage. So these photographs are all from the same angles. The trees that you see are from the nursery of the clients. One of the things that we like to do is design on site. So this project, I went down many times uh, during the construction and personally stuck flags in the ground where important trees would go. One of the biggest challenges was that in order to create enough level area <clears throat> for the residents, they had to cut part of the mountainside Another important principle of our architecture, our landscape architecture and working with the great architects we work with is the idea of blurring the inside and the outside, the integration of the interior and the exterior. These boulders also, the river, the, the piedras were also at the nursery of my clients. And we found a way to use them throughout the site. You can see many of the trees are species that go right up in Chapinque. This water wall, it just drips very moist water. It gives you a nice, pleasant sound as you come to the front entrance of the house. And one of the things that we always try to do is create as many experiences in a garden as possible. There's a hierarchy of space. There's different volumes of space and there's different plant materials. And the hardscape, the, hardscape, the, the stone, the concrete, and the plants link the garden together. And here where there was very little landscapable space off of the, the, the city side of the residence, we actually built a deck out over the, over the hill and created a planter with a railing to keep people away from the edge therefore expanding the amount of space for the family to enjoy. Here you can see what we started with, three meters at the most of, of plantable space, very hard compacted earth. And two years later, maybe three years later, what the garden looks like now. And then the view towards Mitras, which is one of the reasons I love of working and in this area is the beautiful mountains, the Sierra Madres, M, Mitras, uh, Sierra de la Silla. All those things are so spectacular. And the view of the city at night is, is, uh, reminds me of being on the hills outside of Los Angeles and looking at the city from above. It's quite spectacular. And plants are very important. Plants, the volumes we use with plants, um, and the colors, the textures, as Burley Marx always said, a plant, a plant is a note. It can, be, it can be read many ways in how you use it. He always referred to, uh, to um, plants as notes of music. And what you just saw was my initial uh, drawing for a water garden off, off the main bedroom terrace which is right on the hill, and then using the local stones, working with the local uh, artisans to improve on the initial design and, and make what was finally built. But this is what, this shows you there's a little bit of a mystery. You don't know what's around the corner, 
but what's around the corner is the terrace the, is the, where they do a lot of entertaining, but nobody can really see into the master bedroom space. It's a very private space. And working with the uh, sculptor, um, <clears throat> Hugo Zapata, who did, did these testigos on the right, we helped uh, select the sculpture and help place the sculpture in a reflecting pond. And back around, uh, around the corner of the building is where the private garden off the master bedroom is that I showed you before. All of this landscaping here, of the terrace, the green grass is built on top of structure. There are bedrooms and living quarters below. We do a lot of that in Miami because uh, the land has become very valuable and the bigger projects use the structure as a place to build the gardens. Looking back towards where the summer kitchen was built, uh, you can see before, you could see where the structure was, but uh, they wanted, I know that water is very valuable. Uh, they, they wanted to uh, have a big lawn area, as big as they could possibly have for entertaining. They have a large family and for family events. Uh, we often use uh, lawn in Florida because we get 60 inches of rainfall a year or more. And uh, here it was worth the, the cost of the water because they use it a lot. But you can see the plants that I used in the garden, the trees are the same trees, a lot of them that are in the forest beyond, and they drift down through the garden and therefore unify the garden with the surrounding forest. Beautiful mountains, Serra de la Silla. Movement is very important in a garden. The lines of a garden are very important and, and the elevation change. Here we gradually go up to a higher area where we, then we have stones. We built the large wall you see on the left so that that became a big planter where we planted other large trees so that would help mask to disguise the cut on the mountain. We painted the concrete a color that would disappear. So uh, you really don't even notice the scar that was made from the mountain for this construction. It's very interesting. Uh, we were there for planting of most of the trees. This particular tree had to be planted up by the summer kitchen and the crane wouldn't reach all the way to where we needed to plant it. So you can see this is we planted the trees before we built the elevation of the grade. You can see what we had to start with before the wall that would hide the, the, the cut. And then we actually had to pull on ropes and do a tug of war to move the tree the final couple of feet to get it inside the hole. That's the sculptor Hugo Zapata, who made this uh, seat from a stone. He just flattened the boulder and ground it to a nice smooth edge. The next garden I'm going to show you is El Alear. We did that with uh, London Mar Martinez. I worked a lot with uh, Agustin, uh, Agustin um, Landa and his father at the beginning of the project. And we worked also with uh, Patricia Duran. The site initially was a home site with several houses on a busy road and on a quiet road, went between the two. These are some of our initial studies where we're trying to make sections to show what part of the garden is on, um, is on structure and what part isn't where we could actually plant. The first thing we always try to solve when we're doing a project is the circulation. This project had very complex cir circulation. There were two drop-off lobbies at different elevations to get to the four buildings.
But the idea was to make the garden cover a good part of the, of the parking underneath and therefore seem larger. So this is our this is our site plan where we're actually showing the trees and the swimming pools. And it's interesting because when we first did this garden, when we first saw the plans, there was a paddle court that was supposed to stick up in the garden above the ground. And in studying the architecture and the parking garage beneath, we found that we could actually drop the lower the, the paddle court into the garage and therefore diminish the scale and the obtrusiveness of the, of the, the element, therefore creating um, more of a con continuity of the garden as you move uphill. We do a lot of 3D studies. A lot of this was not built like this. There was, there was actually less uh, of the organic shape in many areas except for the pavement. Here you see the blue uh, element is the paddle court. And, and we and, uh, added a water feature off of the long rectangular swimming pool and created an upper pool where, that has a beautiful views of, of MA. So the idea was to create with many families on the property to create as many garden opportunities as possible with views of, of the mountains. Some of the sections where we actually showing the, our, some of our design solutions. And then the finished project. We ended up working with uh, Landa, Landa Martinez to create um, a deceleration entrance because cars go by so fast. And this is actually the entrance and the exit, one of the exits of the property. So there had to be plenty of room to be able to pull off of the road and to be able to see the, on, the oncoming cars. And uh, I love the architecture that was designed for here where the roof is suspended. It became a green roof and it's cantilevered and has, it looks like it's floating in the air basically. And the garden uh, shortly after construction. One of the things that, that we loved about this, this design that was there before we started was this incredible ramp that went from one level to the next. But it was, it's, we felt it was too steep for everybody. So we created a set of steps next to it so that you had the opportunity to choose to walk on the steps or up the ramp. So that's the, that's the paddle court that we create, that we came up with the idea to lower it down into the garage so it didn't have to be so obtrusive in the garden. And then we create, one of the things I like that Barragan did when you move through, as I imagined from his photos, as you move through a space, as you float, you float up through the garden. You don't come up to a, an abrupt set of steps and have to climb and put a lot of effort so you can move from one level to the next easily. And this ended up being the upper garden that we did there's the, uh, from above, the gardens have to look beautiful from above because whereas they have an incredible view of the mountains, they also need to have a beautiful garden to look down into. And the upper pool that we added has a really nice relationship to the view of the mountains. We like to do gardens that are more natural than, than contrived. We believe in using plant material that can grow to its actual genetic uh, characteristics, not to plant a plant and, and trim it into something it doesn't want to be. We also believe in using as many native plants as possible so that uh, if there's an extreme change from that region that we work in, so if there's an extreme change in web, weather or a flood or 
uh, you know, they need less nutrients, then they'll still they'll be able to survive in, in, a, in a drastic change of, of climate. The last project that we just finished, the Casa Tara Garden, Casa Tara was done by uh, Uranza and Ruiz. It was a family compound. It was meant to have four houses. So far, one of the houses has been built. There's two more will be built in the future. And the site of the third house it was determined that it would be best to make a, a playground and an athletic recreation center that the entire family could use. These are some of our earlier renderings. This also required a big cut in the uphill grade uh, with a, about a 10 meter cut. So some of the ideas working with the architect to create spaces, this is a private garden off the master bedroom that has a spa, a water wall, and a shower. This is a view from above, seeing a, a project under construction. A lot of earth was moved. And then one of the great things that we did and that we try to do on all of our projects is the public realm. Where there's an opportunity to beautify the public realm, we always take it. Uh, you'll see later on, on the project we did for ourselves here in Miami and Coconut Grove, uh, but the sidewalk was really wide. It was all concrete and there were just a few trees that were not doing well. So we ended up bus busting up the concrete, doing a new sidewalk and creating a lot more trees and vegetation, which had two effects. One, it made the property much more beautiful from the outside and it made a much nicer environment for the people who walked by here. And the other thing I did was help give more privacy to the property itself. And where the entrance was to be in order to preserve the land for the other houses, we found there was a beautiful big live oak tree that no one knew was there because it was actually growing on the other side of the wall. However, the root system came onto our property. So we had to adjust the whole entrance to make sure the tree did not die. And I'd say that the tree makes the entrance so much nicer. That's a Encino Siempre Verde, and it's very old. And working to the, 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 um, the procession through the property to the entrance of the house is always something very important that we try to choreograph. Here you see we, um, we created planters to, to be able to mitigate the height of the walls that need to be built for privacy and for the grade cut. Once again, the walls were pretty formidable to start with. So using trees and cascading plants and planting at the base of the walls, we were able to soften them and create a much nicer welcoming to the residents. One of the things that we love is the Washingtonia robusta palm trees that grow in Monterey and you can see all over the hillside. We like to bring them into the garden so that we can continue the fabric of the villa, of the, of the, of the, of the landscape, the surrounding landscape, which also helps us tie the project into the site, into the location. This large Siempre Verde, we actually relocated from another part of the site to make it the main element to, at the arrival where you can be dropped off and you can go to the swimming pool or you can go up to the right to the, uh, to the um, pavilion that was created for the family's recreation area. And this is a view from the pavilion. There was going to be a house here, but once again, um, it was determined for the family, it'd be much nicer to have uh, a family center that everybody could come join and enjoy the festivities of get family get togethers and get togethers with friends. Once again, these, these angles are, are pretty much the same exact angles uh, that, that you see on the lower left.
Working with the design team, we selected all the materials and the patterns for the, for the pavement and for the walls. We actually worked with the architects to help conceptualize what the pavilion could be. Uh, and they just did an amazing job making it something really that added to the entire project. It can be closed or it can be open. And from the pavilion, you look down to the paddle court in the lower level, and then you look into the playgrounds and up to the mountains. And you see, and you can experience the architecture from another vantage point. Once again, when you're working with bold architecture, you need to do bold moves for the landscape. So these sets of steps didn't need to be as wide as they were, but we felt that the scale of the hardscape and the landscape needs to relate to the scale of the architecture. One of the things we try to do is, is make it look like one person designed everything, that the, there's, there isn't a place where the interior or the landscape or the architecture transitions to another designer. There's a cohesiveness and a harmony that, that, trans, that transforms everything into the same experience, a unified experience. Here's those stairs again with a bench at the top. And once again, the beautiful thing about this garden was the surrounding, there's an arroyo there the surrounding landscape that will never be destroyed is becomes part of our garden. It's what the Japanese would call a borrowed landscape. The view from the kitchen window. And this, is, this shows you how, how much of a cut there was on the back, on the, on the upper ground. So the whole idea was to create a wall, a planter in front of it with a nicer material paint the top part of the wall a color that would disappear, and then make it so that you really only see the mountains and the landscape down at the, at the ground level. So this is, this is actually more of a courtyard garden than anything else. It has a scale of a courtyard. This is a view from the master bedroom. And the view of the private garden, the secret garden off the master bedroom. I'm impressed by the construction in Mexico. I'm impressed by how hard everybody works and how organized everybody is and that big things can be done. This is an area where there's a shower or just a water wall. Once again, the sound of water helps psychologically cool the space and, and brings joy into a garden. We create, because there's such great metal workers in Mexico, we were able to create these big, long planters that are built on site, which is something we don't get to do too much up here in Miami where cost would be prohibitive. And some of the wonderful cascading plants. So going back here, you can see that the upper wall isn't completely covered yet. We painted it so it would disappear and the vines will eventually cover it so that you'll just see green and stone. This is a pretty good before and after. Uh, it's, it's amazing. I would go away for, for a few months to a six months or so, and then I'd come back and, and things would be magically different. But there's a direct relationship to the garden elements and the interior of the house so that everything is reinforcing the other element of the design. So now leaving Mexico, hasta luego Mexico, going to our garden in Coconut Grove. This is where we practice. We're a firm of 23 people. I uh, have a lot of talented people here that help make everything that we do possible. And uh, we have a lot of great opportunities to do projects. 
In this particular project, we wanted, we, we had to move off of our temporary uh, project. I'm sorry. We had an office on the river downtown in Miami for 14 years, but we rented the space. We didn't own it. And when they threw us off the space, we had to, I decided to buy a building so that we would never have to move again. So we bought a building. These are some of our early drawings. And the whole idea was to create a garden in the city, which is one of the things we always try to do is bring nature back into the city. And we had to convince the city to allow us to landscape beyond our property. So we did these renderings to show them what we thought that our property could look like. It's the greenest block in Coconut Grove. I might even say the city. But here we're showing uh, big trees, the legacy trees we call them, a tree that we'll plant that'll be there for hundreds of years and in improve the overall community. This is the project finished. You can see the relationship to downtown Miami in the background, but uh, we basically live in a forest within the city. This is, a, I'm in the space, the, se the, the second lit floor is where I'm speaking to you from right now. And we planted everything here except for the very large oak tree, which also happens to be an Encino Siempre Verde. Here you can see what the building looked like when we started. And we, uh, we renovated the entire building, uh, all new electric, plumbing, uh, AV, you name it. The city's property where we built sidewalks, where there were new sidewalks okay. Okay. and landscape. So now what happens is people bring their children here in strollers and they walk their dogs and it's and it and it actually functions as a park for this part of the city. We have places for our, our, our teammates to have lunch outside and enjoy themselves. And for the sound of water, that makes the space much nicer because we're on a very busy road on one side and we're surrounded by traffic. We created this water wall. Once again, using art in the garden, which is something we always try to incorporate. These are a couple of testigos by Hugo Zapata, the Colombian uh, sculptor. And this is actually the view of my balcony outside looking at the oak tree. Another project that we worked with, uh, Herzog and Demeron, the Swiss architects. This is an urban project on Miami Beach. This was, uh, this was when uh, Morris Lapidus had already designed the block as a, as a pedestrian mall, but over the years, it was eventually uh, changed to where it was just a street parking lot. I mean, a street level parking lot where there was once an old building. And then Herzog and Demeron came up with the idea of working with the local developer, Robert Wennett, to create a parking garage that was iconic and had more functions than just parking cars. And then the retail of the project is what really made the money for the project to be successful. These are some of the earlier studies that we did of different geometries and, and, and treatments of the ground plane. One of my earlier sketches, different types of sketches, all the team members were working on different, uh, different solutions, working with Christine Bingenswanger from Herzog and Demeron, one of the partners. And this is what the final design was. The only difference is that uh, we ended up, because this is in the historic district of Miami Beach, you have to use red sidewalks in the historic district. But we were able to convince the city to allow us to just use the black and white and not do the, uh, the and eliminate the red. Once again, always trying to simplify, I believe less is more. This is a structure that we had to create to, to house all of the equipment for the water gardens, the parking garage where the seventh floor 
actually functions as a community space. People have weddings there. There's a lot of uh, programmed events there. And on the left is how we, how we found Lincoln Road. And then we created a garden that used all native plants from the Florida Everglades. We brought the jungle back into the city. And we love doing gardens that more people can see and the public can enjoy. It took a long time uh, before any green, any green was planted here. There was a lot of infrastructure for the whole block that had to be created, as well as soil to be brought in for the trees that we planted. Before it was a very sterile uh, road where you couldn't get from one side of the block to the other. And we eliminated all that and made it so it's very easy to cross from one side to the next. And we have four water gardens and they're all tied together and they're all, uh, they all use bi uh, biological filtration and, um, and have fish and turtles and life. And the kids just love this when they come to this block. All native Florida plants, except for the bromeliads. And the wildlife will come back to the city if you give them something to come for. This is the, the, the American lily from the Everglades. And on top of the garage, we worked with Herzog and Demeron and the client to build their private residence. Part of it on top of the old building, the old existing bank building, and part of it on top of the parking garage. Some of the earlier sketches that we did, trying to incorporate water. And then one of our sketches to show that we wanted to add trees on the slope garden to give a different dimension. And this is what it looks like now. There's very little soil. Uh, so we used a lot of vines to be able to create a lot of biomass. And you can walk up to the top of the hill where the, the, there's a bench and, and you can look out at the city from there. This tree I actually brought back from, from Brazil from Sitio Burley Marx as an air layered cutting. And I imported this plant here and it's just a beautiful acacia. The trunk is always red. And here on the left, you see what we started with, all concrete, nothing for plants. And you see the, the relationship to the parking garage down below. This is one of my favorite photos. And you're in the middle of the city and, and you're on top of a parking garage, but yet you have a real sense of peace and quiet and isolation on top of this garden. And one of the things we did with, when we designed the swimming pool was to pull it away from the corner of the building so that you could then see the water and you could see the city from the swimming pool. This is where this deck was where all the mechanical equipment of the building was before and it was all relocated in order to be able to create this garden that linked with the new garden. Another garden that we did, we did the entire district, the Fina district in Miami Beach, working with Herzog and Dem I'm sorry, Foster Partners. Brandon Hall was the architect. Some of the earlier studies that we did of the site plan some of the earlier renderings. Once again, trying to bring nature into the garden. Uh, certain restrictions meant that we couldn't do quite the geometry that we wanted. You can see it's right along the boardwalk of Miami Beach. We actually brought in a lot of the trees that you see here because there was no shade as you walked through the garden. And once again, we are trying to link our garden with the, with the, the surrounding landscape. We did both the, uh, the garden on the right with the Fina House as well as the, the Fina Hotel on the left. And we did the boardwalk and all the landscaping around it. And this is a uh, before and after what we started. We also did work with OMA across the street for the arts district. This is the ADA ramp. Uh, so someone in a wheelchair can get from the street up to the, to the lobby without any problem. 
This is the project we did with OMA across the street, which actually is an art center. And it, there's parking below grade that links under the street to the rest of the, of the development. And here, once again, all of this landscape is on top of structure. So we created planters, we created uh, walkways that, that without steps, so you could, you could move from one place to another if you were in a wheelchair. This is before they even built the building. So you can see there was, an other, there was another building there that was an old building that was torn down. And this is from the same angle from the beach access. We did all the contract documents for the hardscape, working, of course, in collaboration with the architects. Uh, one of the reasons I love working with uh, being a landscape architect even is because I love architecture. And if I was an architect, I would only do my architecture. But as a landscape architect, I get to work with a lot of architects and a lot of architecture. And I get to learn a lot and I get to enjoy architecture in a way that I normally would never have been able to do. Jade Signature is another project we did with, 40 minutes now, we did with Herzog and Demron. This is a site plan at the beginning. This, this building is a, seven, is a 70 story tower with all the parking below grade, some of the earlier renderings and completed project with the beach comes right up to the project. The swimming pool is actually above the parking garage. And, and we brought in a huge tree and, and it's actually planted on top of the parking garage, but there's a big planter that goes into the parking garage. There's two pools, one has a, a beach entry and the other one is more for laps using mostly plants that grow right on the beach as a landscape material, created different paths to the, to the beach from the property. This project is a recent project. It's probably only five years old now. What we saw when we started on the left and what from the same angle. This project is a project where we had Worked with a builder who developed two houses. The one on the bottom was with Sayota from South Africa, and the one on the top was with MK27, Marcio Kogan from Brazil. Some of my earlier sketches for, for circulation. And some of the before and after images. You pass through the garden upper ramp to the main public area. So one of the tricks was making sure that you couldn't see the other house, and that there's a sense of, uh, of privacy from one property to the next. And we like to create the look of the edge of the woods on our property so you don't know if they only cleared a little bit of land and they have more land or not. And then project down in Nevis, I'll just go through quickly, working with the famous artist Bryce Marden and Helen Marden. We did a lot of digging and excavation, which led to placement of a lot of boulders. This is a, this is a, a little hotel, a small a boutique hotel with a, with a beautiful restaurant and some of the best food in Nevis. Once again, incorporating water into the garden. Our site plans, a lot of grading. We had to regrade a, a, a nearby gut to, uh, to fix the erosion of some previous hurricane. And we incorporated areas that weren't even supposed to be part of the garden into the overall garden. There's beautiful remnants of, of, the, of the plantation that was there. What the property looked like on the lower left, and then what we did. It took a lot of uh, took a lot of imagination. It took some equipment, and it took uh, clients who love plants and love gardens. This was a before of the of where the the owner's cottage is. 
that has since been uh, um, redone by Ed Tuttle, the architect. And this is us trying to figure out how to direct the water through the project and then the finished product. Project in Panama, where the site was barren and it was an old chicken farm and we were able to re-sculpt the land and then tie, in with the, tie the landscape in with the surrounding mountains. In order to get the fill we needed to be able to do the, the landforms, we actually dug a large lake where we irrigate the project from the lake and create once again, the sound of water moving into the garden. Once again, the, the idea of bringing the trees from the forest into the garden and linking the two, uh, the two environments. This is the last one. This is a project we did in New York, the Ford Foundation. Kevin Roche uh, project it did with Dan Kiley. We had to bring trees up from Florida and acclimate them. They had to rebuild the entire garden. You can probably go on their website and see, uh, see um, the film that shows, um, shows the entire process in a minute. And this is what we ended up with when we were finished. I have Guy sitting over here on the right of me. He's from Chile. He's an architect who also became a landscape architect. He's been the project manager uh, and co-designer for many of these projects that you're seeing. But the idea here was to recreate what Dan Kiley had done, which is a forest in the city, uh, bringing nature into the city once again. And once this is the uh, my last slide, and it's showing the window that I created in the master bedroom garden of a ventana a la montaña so that I could see Mitras at a certain time of day from within the house. And that's what gave the project the name. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Raymond. Thanks for your lecture. I'm opening uh, questions for the public and the people uh, here in the room, in the Zoom, chat may either post your questions directly in English or we help you translate if that is needed. Pueden realizar sus preguntas dentro del chat. Comenzaremos con las de Zoom. Ya tenemos algunas por YouTube, pero comenzamos como siempre con las de la sesión Zoom. Si gustan eh, hacerlas ya sea en inglés o en español. Muy bien, paso a la, a la primera pregunta. Entonces, este, está el, el arquitecto Mario Díaz, que está viendo la sesión desde Chiapas. Eh, nos pregunta, ¿qué le diría a personas jóvenes para eh, motivarlos dentro de lo que es el estudio del paisajismo? What would you say to young people, Raymond, in I order to motivate the them? Perdón. I understood the question. Okay, great. I would say that uh, that I would say what um, what Roberto Burley Marx told all of the young designers that he knew is to stay curious. You know, we're in a profession, the design pr profession, where we actually get paid to be to be creative and to have fun creating things that don't exist, and it's a lot of hard work. You all know that, but the but the rewards are are wonderful. So even though I work a lot of hours, it never really feels like I'm working. It feels like I'm doing what I was meant to do. And, and, and as Burley Marx also always said, do what you like. Gracias. Muy amable. Thank you. Um, Another comment made through our YouTube chat, they say that they were very impressed with the word, with the phrase, I mean, touch the air lightly. If you may say something else about that. Muy impresionados por la frase de tocar ligeramente la tierra. Pudiera decir algo más de eso, Raymond? So I would say that, uh, so one of the main things that we try to do is preserve preserve things that are worth preserving. 
preserve natural areas. But sometimes to be able to create the look of touching the earth lightly, you have to do some serious, some serious uh, alterations to the site. And the alterations we do are to create microclimates where the plants can thrive, where we, the water that we do get, we move to where the plants can utilize it. So uh, I do think that uh, I, one, of the, one of the architects whose work I like is, is Rick Joy in, in, in um, the United States. And he builds his buildings in natural areas and only allows a couple of meters of, of area around the house to be cleared. And then they build the house in the middle of nature. So, you know, that's kind of hard to do in the city. It's kind of hard to do in most places because you have neighbors and things like that. So, uh, but, but the philosophy is what we try to do to create a landscape that looks like it's always been there and that it's appropriate and, it's, and it was inevitable. So we try to make it look like we aren't doing anything when in fact we are doing an awful lot to be able to obtain that. Wow. Gracias. Eh, Alberto Gabiundo, buenas noches. Me gustaría preguntar cómo afronta la diferencia de condiciones ambientales y variación de especies en todos los países en, en los que ha trabajado. Y es la misma pregunta que hace Ernesto Tijerina. Eh, ¿Cómo afronta tal variedad de especies, Raymond, al haber trabajado en diferentes países? Well, you know, I think that another thing that's very important if you're going to be a creator is to have a, a power of observation. And part of what we do is research, either there, looking around with our eyes, seeing what grows well, seeing what's from the region, learning from people from that region, and then doing research of the plant material that grows in that region. For me, it's a joy, I love plants. So every time I work in an area with different vegetation, I always try to get an expert in the region to work with me and a horticultural consultant, as well as working with people who do beautiful work in that region and, and just learning about the plants because it's amazing what you, can, what you can find on the internet when you research plants. In Mexico, I had to research plants using the Mexican common name because no one uses botanical names there, <clears throat> at least not when I was down there initially. So I made my own plant palette by researching books that were there. Uh, I, there's a great tr book, The Trees of Monterrey that I had that was very helpful to me. And the rest of it, uh, I put the botanical names on the plants so that I could have a discussion with people about the plants. I could understand which plants they were using because every place you work, the common names of plants are completely different. So the only way to really tell somebody exactly what you want is to use the botanical name because that's easy to research online wherever you are. Gracias. Eh, otra pregunta, eh, y esta va específico al edificio de Herzog y de Merún. Eh, en términos de mantenimiento de esos jardines que están en la cubierta, ¿qué, qué tan espeso, uh, porque nos lo hicieron en inglés, de depth of the soil layer en la parte superior de, del, del proyecto? Seis pulgadas en la mayoría de los lugares solamente. Y en otros lugares podemos poner más, más ¿cómo se llama? Mound. Amontonar. Amontonar la tierra para, para, para los raíces de plantas más grandes. Thank you. Eh, ¿Alguna pregunta Forgive de los asistentes? Forgive de... my Spanish. <laughs> no, great. <laughs> ¿Alguna otra pregunta que quede en la sala para formularla, ya sea en español o en inglés? Adelante, arquitecto Fernando. Un comentario y una pregunta breve. Eh, felicitarlo por el trabajo exhaustivo, de gran detalle. 
en diversas escalas y lo que más me atrae es la relación con el lugar. ¿Es right? Yo entiendo. Y, sí, ok. Sí. Y la pregunta, ¿qué tiene que ver con el lugar? En Monterrey, en la sierra, en los lugares donde trabajas, eh, existe un lugar potente como la montaña, la topografía, el slope, ¿verdad? La vegetación. Y el diseño se trata de usar el lugar. Y en los otros proyectos, como los edificios mencionados, el diseño de paisaje crea el lugar. Crea un lugar propio, diferente a tener relación con una montaña. ¿Es right? correcto? Sí. ¿Podría hablar algo extra sobre eso? I, you know, I have to work with what I have. I don't always have beautiful mountains and topography. So sometimes we create our own topography in Florida where it's very flat. But uh, we use trees uh, to help create certain scales. And unfortunately, we are able to use large trees. So we don't have to wait 40 years the way Burley Marks had to on many of his gardens. He would plant a tree this big. And then I would see it 40 years later, you know, as a huge tree. So um, I think each space, is, each place has its own, has its own soul. Each, each area has its own um, genus loci, they call it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's what I try to find. And, and, you know, I always go to the site. I always try to go as many times as I can. During COVID, I actually had to design a project in California without ever having been to the site. And that was a little difficult, but what helped me was uh, the drone footage. I was able to have them shoot the drone footage for me of, of, of the site from all angles and a lot of photographs from on the ground. It's not my favorite way of working. In fact, I don't like it at all. I feel like I have to eat. Even if a site is flat and it looks like nothing's there, there's something that you'll see when you go there and you're in the thir third dimension. Gracias. ¿Alguna otra pregunta? Tenemos una en el, en el chat de aquí, eh, Zoom. Eh, ah, bueno, el arquitecto Bernardo Hinojosa y paso con la siguiente pregunta. Adelante, arquitecto. Eh, oh. first, of all, first of all, congratulations, wonderful, wonderful work. Uh, it, you really create uh, very beautiful spaces. But I have a question. Here in Monterrey, we are in a very serious water crisis. Uh, we, we, ha, we, we have no water. How do you re relate, re relate this, the kind of, uh, of, of garden that, that you show us with the fact that, uh, that we don't have water? I have seen, for instance, uh, in Phoenix, Arizona, or in some of other places where they do have uh, a water, pro water problems, and the landscape reflects that, that fact. If you go, they, they have beautiful, beautiful gardens in Phoenix. Uh, I remember that, that city in particular. But they don't use water. They, it's just hard, hard space, hardscape, uh, desert, desert plants, and they are beautiful. But they are very conscious of 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 the, of, of the water scarcity. How do you relate to the when when you design these things in Monter in Monterey with the the problem that we have in in, in our city that uh, we are just not having enough water even to drink? You know, um, we've done other projects in in Mexico. Some of them haven't been built, where we worked with. Uh, only the plants from the desert region that were there. Um, and that's something we always try to do now in Monterrey, we use the trees that are from that area. We use trees that can live with the amount of rainfall that you get. So the, so the extra water is going to the lawn. We try to minimize the lawn whenever possible. I would use gravel instead of lawn there if it were up to me. So if the grass dies because there's not enough water, I'm totally happy with having gravel where the where the grass was because it's a plain but 
the gardens that I've done there are, are I think, are a reflection of Monterey more than they're a reflection of, of Baja California, for instance. Um, so, so I am also very aware of, of, the, of the scarcity of water. Okay. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. ¿Alguien más de la sesión Zoom o paso a la siguiente pregunta que tenemos en YouTube? Muy bien. Eh, nos preguntan respecto al libro que encontraste útil, eh, Raymond, para el proyecto aquí en Monterrey, que si es el libro hecho por Osvaldo Zurita de Plantas Nativas o algún otro libro que, que hayas utilizado, si recuerdas. The book that I got was the, the Trees of Monterrey. It was the name of the, of the book. Los Árboles de Monterrey. Los Árboles de Monterrey. Sí, es un libro muy bueno. Excelente. Y eh, también nos preguntan, ¿cuál es su modelo o ideal de arquitecto paisajista a seguir, Raymond? Did you, did you follow that? Well, uh, there's a great one in Mexico, Mario Shetanen. He's very good. Um, Michael Van Valkenburg is a very, uh, very big influence on my work. Uh, of course, Roberto Burley Marx. Um, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted was pretty important in my life, uh, studying his work. And there are many others that you can learn from. You know, I try not to copy anybody, but I do get influenced by others. So there's just one of the great things is there's so many, so many great landscape architects around that you can learn from and architects as well. But I like landscape architects who try to work with nature and try to, I was trained in college to design with nature. And that's sort of my mission is to try to create habitats for both humans and the local flora and fauna. So I tend to be more interested in landscape architecture that's, that's sensitive to the environment and not necessarily creative just to be creative. Muchas gracias. Esa era una pregunta de Ernesto Tijerina. También gracias Ernesto Tijerina por extendernos la pregunta para esta eh, noche. Y bueno, finalmente una pregunta del arquitecto Jaime Juárez. Eh, ¿Cómo controlas o has encontrado restricciones ecológicas en el uso de la, de la flora o plantas en cada país? Well, you know, it's some places that I go, there's no nursery industry. There's no, there's no, there's no con landscape construction industry. So we try to propagate from the local, the local landscape. And then many times in the Caribbean, for instance, we ship plants from Florida because Florida and the Caribbean have almost the same uh, ecosystem. We get a little more rain than they get. But what we try to do is um, see what does well and wherever we're working and try to use, use that, you know, Use the trees that are thriving where we work. Muchas gracias. Algo más que quisieras eh, agregar, Raymond? Muchísimas no, gracias. Eh, creo que ese es nuestro comentario final. Agradecemos mucho. Perdón. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks to you, Raymond. Agradecemos al arquitecto paisajista Raymond Jungles que esta noche nos haya acompañado y compartido sus experiencias, conocimiento y tan emblemáticos proyectos, no sin antes permitirme realizar un anuncio antes de terminar eh, la sesión de hoy eh, que me gustaría compartirles. Recientemente lanzamos la convocatoria al quinceavo Gran Premio de Arquitectura Joven al cual invitamos a participar a los estudiantes de arquitectura de las facultades y universidades locales. Este concurso propone diseñar una modalidad de barrio pospandemia enfocado al estilo de vida del siglo XXI, una ciudad sin fronteras, 
se deberá crear un barrio más humano que permite el uso de la tecnología de punta y generar espacio público como el lugar de convivencia y estar accesible, democrático e inclusivo, con parques y espacios verdes para uso y disfrute contemplativo de los habitantes del barrio y la comunidad. Los estudiantes interesados en participar pueden inscribirse a través de la dirección de los directores y directoras de sus respectivas escuelas de arquitectura o bien contactarnos en la página de web de la academia www.anamti.org. Cedo ahora la palabra a la arquitecta Rena Porcel para que realice el anuncio de la próxima sesión del capítulo. Un segundo, por favor. Eh, el próximo, eh, le, le invitamos eh, a nuestra siguiente ponencia que se, lleva, se llevará a cabo el día 7 de marzo y va a ser eh, con el, el arquitecto Charles Valtay, eh, que originalmente fue profesor en, en Chicago, después ha estado en Canadá y ahora está eh, en Harvard University of Graduate School of Design. Eh, y les invitamos a que nos acompañen eh, a esta sesión que va a estar eh, muy interesante. Muchas gracias, Rena. Extiendo de nuevo mi agradecimiento al arquitecto Raymond Jungles y los esperamos eh, la sesión el siguiente mes que acaba de anunciar eh, la arquitecta Rena Porcel. Siendo las 20, 21 horas del día de hoy, declaro concluida esta sesión. Muchísimas gracias a ustedes por su compañía. Buenas noches. Gracias Raquel, ya terminó la grabación. Muchas gracias sí, sí, a los presentes. Gracias. gracias a todos, muy bien. Gracias a todos, excelente y creo que impresionante obra. Raymond ya es una hora más tarde para él, por eso se retiró un poco rápido de la sesión, pero eh, le agradecemos mucho. Siempre fue muy gentil y muy amable y generoso con nosotros compartiendo información. Sí, muy bien. Muchas gracias, buenas noches. Gracias, Julieta. Buenas noches. Gusto en no, verte. Verte, Julieta. Muchas gracias. Felicidades gracias. a todos. Gracias, Fernando. Nos vemos gracias, pronto. Fernando. Gracias, buenas noches. Aquí, Juan. Gracias, gusto en verte. Igualmente, un abrazo. Fuerte. Bueno, que descansen.